This is the first lecture for section 2.5 on miscellaneous voting methods. In this lecture, we'll be talking about the sequential pairwise voting method. So the idea behind the sequential pairwise method is that we like pairwise voting because we can use majority rule, and we're pretty confident using May's theorem that majority rule is a pretty fair system when we have exactly two candidates. But what we've seen when, I, when we looked at Condorcet's method is that if we look at all of the pairwise elections, sometimes we don't get a winner, and that's a pretty big flaw with that method. So we're going to modify Condorcet's method, and instead what we're going to do is we're going to pick an ordering for the candidates and match them up two at a time, eliminating the loser of that pairwise election before we move on to the next matchup. So here are the details. So in the sequential pairwise voting, what you do is you pick an order for the candidates, and that's called the agenda, and you match up the first two candidates on the agenda and find the winner of that pairwise election. The loser of that election is eliminated, and the winner moves on to be matched up against the next candidate on the agenda. And you keep doing this, repeat this process for the rest of the agenda. And at the end, the candidate who's the last person standing, they're going to win the overall election. So here we have an example of a voter profile. And let's say that the agenda is just alphabetical order A, B, C, D. So the idea here is that it's kind of like a tournament bracket. So our first round, we're going to have A versus B. And whoever wins that is going to go up against C, the next person on the list. And then whoever wins that is going to go up against D, and then whichever candidate is left at the end, they're the overall winner. So the way that we figure out these winners of these individual elections, the winners here, here, and here, is the same as what we do with the Condorcet method. We're going to look at that one-on-one -on -one matchup. So if you remember how we did that, we're going to start looking at A versus B, and we're just going to look at each row of our voter profile and figure out which of those two candidates will each group of voters vote for. So in our first row of our table, these four voters, they like A the best, so when they have the choice, they're going to vote for A when they can. These three voters, well, they have C as their top choice, and C is not on the ballot right now, so instead they vote for their second choice, which is also A. And then these three voters, they're going to vote for B because B is their top choice, and if we add these numbers up, we see that A wins 7 to 3. So in this little tournament bracket, A is going to win that first round and move on to face C. So now we have an A versus C election, but we're going to figure out the winner of that the same kind of way. So now, again, we're going to look at our profile. We're going to look at each row of our table one at a time. So we're going to start by looking at this group of four voters. They like A the best, so of course they're going to vote for A. This second row of our table, this group of three voters, they like C the best, so they're going to vote for C. And these three voters, well, let's see, they like B the best, but they can't vote for B right now. They like D second best, but D's not a choice either, so instead they have to vote for their third choice, which is also C. So C is going to win this election 6 to 4. So A gets eliminated and C moves on to the final round facing off against D. So finally we have to figure out a C versus D matchup and again looking through our table one row at a time. So we look at the first row of our table. We see that if it's C versus D they can't vote for A, they can't vote for B, so instead they vote for D. So the four votes go to D. These three voters they have C as their top choice so they'll get to vote for C. That's great. And then the third row of our table, they can't vote for B, so instead they vote for D, so that's three more votes for D, and so D wins seven to three. So the final winner here of this sequential pairwise voting method is D. So do you see any problems with this method? You might already see a couple, you might already have some objections, but let's specifically look at how do our voters feel about just B versus D. So I want you to kind of look at this profile and just in your mind highlight the B's and the D's. So I'll, I'll put a little box around them here to make that a little easier for you. So B versus D, B versus D. And what hopefully you notice here is that every single voter, every voter in the entire election likes B better than D. So 10 out of 10, 10 versus zero, B is preferred over D. So how did this candidate D, which every, every single voter likes someone else better than D, how did that voter, how did that candidate D end up winning the election? Well, the reason is that B in our agenda got eliminated early. So if we changed our agenda so that B didn't get knocked out so early, then maybe B can survive to that final round and end up beating D. So let's change the agenda a little bit. Let's instead of A, B, C, D, let's do A, C, B, D. So same kind of situation. We've got A versus C this time. Those are the first two candidates on my agenda. And then the winner will go up against the next candidate on the agenda. And then the winner will go against the last candidate on the agenda. So A versus C, if we work that out, A versus C, the four voters in the first row of my table, they like A the best. The three voters in the second row of my table, they like C the best. 
And if you look at the third row of that table, those voters are going to vote for C. So that means that C is going to win that election four to six. So C survives to that second round. Now we look at B versus C. When we work that out, B versus C, the four voters in the first row of my table, they like A the best, but A's already been eliminated. So instead they're going to vote for B. Four votes goes to B. And then in the second row of my table, they like C the best, so they'll vote for C. And then the three voters in the third row of my table, they like B the best, so they'll vote for B. And B beats C, seven to three. So B goes on to the last round. And as we've already seen, B is going to beat D in that last round election, 10 to zero. So this makes B the winner. So what we're seeing here is that the result of the election heavily depends on the ordering of the candidate. It depends on this agenda. And this also shows that sequential pairwise voting fails a pretty fundamental fairness condition. And the fairness condition is called the Pareto condition. And it says that if every single voter, right, this, this condition doesn't mess around, right, every single voter prefers one candidate over another, then the second candidate, the, the non-preferred candidate, should not be the winner. If every single person, every single voter, likes one candidate over another, that other candidate should not win. It should not be possible for them to win. And yet in our system, in our sequential pairwise method, we see that that is possible. So this condition is named after Vilfredo Pareto, who was an Italian economist. And like I said, this example that we just worked through shows that this new method that we just learned does not satisfy this pretty simple condition. So what about plurality, right? We've talked about plurality voting. It's the system that's most common in the US. Does plurality voting satisfy the Pareto condition? So let's imagine, right? So we could come up with some examples, but let's actually think about the, the theory here. Suppose we had an election, a plurality election, and every voter preferred A more than B. Could B actually be the plurality winner? Well, let's think about how many first place votes could B get? Remember that for plurality, all we care about are first place votes. So if everybody likes A more than B, that doesn't mean they like A the most, it just means they like A more than B. But how could B get any first place votes? Wherever B is ranked in somebody's ballot, A would be higher than that. And so B could never be at the top of someone's ballot because every voter, right, every single voter likes A more than B. So B would get zero first place votes, right? Not just a few first place votes, but zero first place votes. And for plurality, all we care about are the first place votes. So that means that B can't possibly win. B cannot be the plurality winner because to be the plurality winner, you would have to get more first place votes than anyone else. And zero first place votes is never going to be the most number of first place votes. So this shows that the plurality method that we've seen, that we've, we already know we have some flaws with that system, but we know that that system does satisfy the Pareto condition. No matter how we would cook up our example, if every voter likes A more than B, then B can't possibly win. And this is the kind of logical argument that I was talking about in the previous lecture where we said, well, how would we show that a, a voting method does satisfy a condition? An example doesn't do that. So instead we have to come up with a sort of like argument, this logical reasoning that shows us that no matter what we would do, if we wanted to set up this example, that we wouldn't be able to make it so that it would violate the Pareto condition. So next time we're gonna talk about a different voting method. So sequential pairwise voting is pretty flawed because the agenda is just too influential on that final result. So instead of what we'll do is use the idea of eliminating candidates, right? Not one at a time like we do in the sequential pairwise voting, but we can adapt that method to what we call runoff elections. And that's what we're gonna be talking about in the next lecture.